In the previous episode of the Zista podcast, we were talking about the intersection of AI and healthcare. And in today's session, we're going to focus on what students need to do to succeed in this space. Welcome to the Zista podcast, where we invite industry leaders and academicians to answer questions that students have within a particular subject area. Joining us today is Sumit Maniyar, a product and business development executive who's worked in different parts of the world and has over 25 years of experience. Let's go straight into the session. Yeah. Hi, Sumit. Welcome back to the Zista podcast. Yes, thanks. Nice to be back again. The last time we connected, we had a really interesting discussion on the intersection of AI and healthcare, how AI is really playing an important role uh, in in improving service delivery and making life of physicians and even say healthcare assistants easier. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities. And it was really interesting to hear from you on, on those points. Yeah, and uh, it's just a fascinating subject and so much is happening that it's very hard to tell. It's just so much to keep track of in the sense that I'm uh, on the side, I'm uh, helping uh, a deep tech venture fund look at AI and I look at the chat channels and all the research papers coming out and it's just, there's no way anyone can uh, keep track of all of it. It's like you need AI for AI to track all the advances of AI. <laughs> Similarly, what was happening in Web3, there was just an explosion of so many crypto and blockchain and this companies and it just, but in AI, it's just uh, gone quite uh, large. I know. I, I think uh, <laughs> while things are going to become really easy and simple for us, uh, the deployment of these solutions, the kind of uh, infrastructure and, and warehousing is going to get more complicated. You can just foresee that, right? <laughs> I thought today we'd focus a little bit more about on you know students. Uh, so there are students who are interested in AI. They may be interested in entering a field uh, relating to AI and healthcare. So I wanted to ask you, what would be, you know, What's an ideal background or what skill sets do students work on if they want to enter the healthcare technology space? I think the healthcare technology space, th there's two ways to go about it. One is you could approach it from the product aspects and in the sense that you may not have to be 100% technical, so you become more product focused in the healthcare space. and. Probably that would come from an engineering background. Now, I know in business schools, they focus on product management, which didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. So that is one area to focus on. The technical side, or even on the product side, where you become a little more technical, the, it's nascent in the sense that you could learn computer science or some computer engineering or aspects of electrical engineering where you're learning coding. And then you could focus on data science or they have AI ML courses or even now majors or sub-majors in those fields. And then you could just apply to healthcare companies. And that's another route to get into that space. I think specifically to get into healthcare as a sector, you could also specialize in a master's in public health or a master's in like an MBA that focuses on uh, healthcare practices or just more on the product side and be focused on just targeting uh, healthcare companies as your uh, first place to work. So I think the barrier to entry is probably easier these days uh, than long before because before hospitals were more focused on the care side or even traditional medicine, I don't, even if it's in US, India, Australia, other places, it was just, you needed the medical degree and those aspects. But now it's opened up with the aspects of using technology and applying it in the healthcare setting. And that opens up avenues from the product side and the engineering side to participate in healthcare. We work with physicians to get well brain into the marketplace, but my background isn't a medical background, it's a technical and a business background. And then if I think of a lot of my colleagues who are in the digital health or health related space or health tech, it's come from kind of different disciplines that somewhere along the line, they focused on healthcare and or engineering and uh, applied their skill set in those verticals. So I think it's a lot easier now. 
you know, the last point you made, and I'm so happy that you did, uh, you know, talking about different disciplines, I thought it'd be really interesting if you could, you know, uh, take a minute and tell us, tell us this. So let's assume you are a service provider uh, offering mm -hmm. an AI based solution in the field of healthcare, right? Uh, students may not anticipate or imagine the different kind of disciplines that people come from to make that solution, you know, a reality. So even if you look at the work that you've done at Wellbrain or perhaps Cipra.ai, what are the different disciplines, uh, you know, from where your em the employees come from, or it could be a service provider, it could be a contractor, it doesn't matter, but what are the different disciplines where people have come from to make that solution uh, or which have helped that solution go to the market? Yeah, so I'm just thinking of all the employees. So at the development side, yes, you had the developers and the engineers that probably hadn't worked in healthcare before, but they get the product requirements and functional requirements from us, then the UI, UX. But then it also comes from uh, salespeople, people who have done sales. And obviously, if uh, in those startup environments, you have you could benefit better if you bring people from some industry expertise, but you know they study different uh, disciplines and they came from a sales or marketing background. So if you think about it, I think to deliver the solution successfully, yes, we had some people in the medical space, which were the physicians. Then we'd get information from our customers, which are kind of physicians and their staff. Sometimes their staff uh, doesn't have to have all the medical requirements. And uh, yes, sales, marketing, some business development, and all these other functions that are classical, when I say classical, in a normal line of business. So I think to answer your question, uh, I'm just thinking about some of the other companies. Yes, there's two PhDs in AI for this other company, but then there are different care people or uh, supervisory people somewhere fresh out of uh, college or university uh, without the medical degree, you know, like, a, you know, liberal arts or other type of degree, and then others were more specific. So I think it's a broader range. It's really interesting. Uh, you asked me that question, and now I'm seeing some people with more specialized degrees from unique universities or different universities saying, oh, I, I you know, engineered or I, I, I studied biology as an undergrad, but I focused on care management, you know, those type of solutions or those type of courses didn't exist. So it's kind of interesting to see these type of uh, disciplines come out with respect to all the people that I've worked with, whether it's contractors or employees. It's, it's really interesting, you know, I mean, um, it's not just the disciplines, but also I would say uh, the different job roles that exist. So I'm imagining that uh, to develop a solution like this, uh, you have people on the infrastructure side with, you know, um, setting up cloud infrastructure, then you would need your mm -hmm. analytics team, you need a data science, people in from data science, data analytics to kind of look at looking at that data, then I would mm -hmm. imagine that you also need people from the visualization side. So the, as you mentioned, the, the UX uh, piece, where people mm -hmm. are visualizing, how do we display this data to the end user? which is the physicians in this case, so that they can use it very effectively. They don't have to look at a table, you know, or things like yep. that. And then, of course, the, the, the other things that you mentioned about sales, business development, marketing, um, and, and research, I would imagine research also is a really important uh, piece of the pie. So it, it, when you think about it, so many different job roles, so many different backgrounds in terms of expertise come together to make a solution take off and I think it's okay to start small but as you start developing it as you start fleshing it out you start looking at what are the skill sets that you need and then to look at people who can fulfill that and to really make that solution uh, go out there in the marketplace so it's really interesting uh, in terms of the journey a startup takes uh, to, to really reach a point where it's being deployed and and being used in many places right yeah, definitely. I think in healthcare, because it's so human centered compared to being a startup in other verticals, it takes a little bit longer, sometimes much longer to get the adoption because you have to have the technology correct, the data correct, and the solution correct. 
such that people can use it because uh, obviously you don't want a health solution that doesn't work. So you actually have to satisfy many more constituents uh, in the delivery of that uh, healthcare solution. If it's on the data health informatics side where you're not involving any people in the loop, then it's easier. Like if it's claims processing or if it's data going from one institution to another, you know, that's a different story. But on the care side of things, yeah, I, I think there has to be a lot of input from all these different disciplines to really make it work and a lot of input from the patients themselves because they have to use it and a lot of input from the staff, not only the physicians, because the physicians may like the solution, but like I said earlier in the previous episode, if the staff don't like it, they may not use it, even though their uh, physician doctor tells them, hey, you need to use it, because if the workload is higher, then they're not going to adopt it. So you have to think about all these type of uh, solutions to work. Pretty interesting. Um, Sumit, what would be your advice to young professionals uh, if professionals out there who want to develop technology solutions for healthcare, uh, what would you tell them? I would tell them there's a lot of opportunity out there right now. And especially what I'm seeing, what's happening in, in India. And I myself have tried several businesses in India and at the time, and it was all related to internet penetration. And now the adoption rate is off the charts. And the good thing is you could probably develop a decent enough solution for the Indian market, and then it could expand on a worldwide basis. You're starting to see that with many, many companies uh, like uh, Innovacer and things like that, where it was an Indian-centric solution that pivoted to the States. So the advice for anyone, I think uh, the opportunity to get into digital health, into the healthcare realm, there's tremendous opportunities, whether it's solving all the early uh, heart attack issues with the Indians, right? Or even diabetes and all these other things that are going on, or even rural solutions. And uh, I think technology can reduce that cost and make it much more efficient. And uh, now with everyone having phones or some type of device, and even lower cost uh, sensors, like even, you know, two, three rupee or no, even 20 rupee sensors, I mean, it's it's just going to be uh, very exciting. And uh, I think, uh, who knows, maybe India could be at the forefront of a lot of things with the advance of Aadhaar. I argue with my wife, you know, worldwide, there might be a worldwide Aadhaar number, right? And uh, if you could use that as your permission to move your patient data from one provider or one health entity, I think places in India where it's not as rigid yet, those type of solutions uh, might come out even better or faster and it could go across the world. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. It's really interesting. And I'm sure a lot of students in India who you know might tune into this podcast will think that uh, there's really scope for me to build something here for India, but then mm -hmm. to also think bigger and yep. really take that solution to other markets. Um, just one thing, because you've had so much experience working with so many different markets, let's assume you have a solution that's successful in one market and you want to take that solution to say another market, what are some of the factors that you should be looking at, uh, before you take that step? And you're talking in particular healthcare or just general experience that I've had? Well, you, you could, uh, res respond from the context of healthcare, but please feel free to draw on your experiences. Uh, you know, in other sectors? So one thing, it was fortunate, so I'll take a step back. When I was in the, from my video game experiences, it was somewhat a little bit easier because video games attract people, you know, all around the world. And then you can make a decision to say, because most people know English, you could start seeing the traffic patterns. And then you say, okay, we need to really enter this market and then stop offering local language solutions and then local language customer support and local language partnerships for distribution. So that was some of the decision points that we made entering into Turkey or Korea or all these markets that I had operated and sometimes I had to live in. And then now with respect to even healthcare, healthcare being regulated, it probably wouldn't be as different with the caveat the U.S. is probably the toughest market to enter with the digital health solution. 
Uh, but I think if you, you can go to NHS or the UK and to enter these markets, yeah, you usually kind of have to go there to learn it and get the lay of the land. Now we had networks to rely on or even opportunities to work with other counterparties, but just by going there, or even the fact that how we met a long time ago was just by making hypotheses and saying, okay, I need to speak to these people to get the solution out. And uh, that's how we met. So I think it still makes sense to be boots on the ground just to learn about the market. And sometimes if you have venture capital investors, they help you with many introductions or you build your networks. And I think with LinkedIn and all these type of things, it kind of brings that cost down to figuring out how to reach into markets. So I don't think it's entering into any market is challenging, but I don't think it was as challenging maybe 20, 30 years ago when you didn't have all these information uh, systems available to you. But uh, I think it's probably a lot easier. Healthcare, again, is a little more regulated. So then you have to figure out the local nu nuances of how solutions really work. And then you can easily, you know, there's so many digital health companies. Uh, I'm part of this ecosystem called Startup Health, and there are health companies from all around the world. And it's like a network. And it's like, oh, hey, there's a CNO in Argentina doing this startup. And I want to know about the Argentinian health market. I could just reach out or maybe fly out there and meet him accordingly. So I think these type of dynamics are uh, much easier you know, especially if you have a company in India and want to start expanding into other markets. It's really, um, really cool. You know, I mean, the the tools and the platforms that are available today to just mm -hmm. get information to network, I think it makes it a lot easier. I think it's really encouraging for students and even I would say young founders to hear this. I'm sure many of them are already, uh, you know, engaged with people in the community, but it 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 this structure that you have explained right now, I think really will really help students uh, really dream big uh, and and plan better. So thank you for for sharing that, Sumit. Yeah, you're welcome, and I'll I'll leave with this note, and this just came into my mind. One of my colleagues, he's now one of the head uh, researchers on the consulting side at IBM for AI, and a couple of years ago, he told me. So many companies are coming to India just because of the data sets available and largely because so many Indians now have mobile phones and it's just much more robust, richer data that they can get for inputs into training AI models. So you guys are right there. I think uh, that tells you something. And, you know, he's, you know, they're doing the consulting with big FMCGs or Fortune 500 or Global 1000 type companies. So, you know, there's a lot of rich uh, data to be leveraged from India and can be used in uh, other use cases. And one last thing I will say is like, we're trying to get more data faster with respect to Cipra. And similarly, there's another company called Twin Health and did the, the same thing. Solution was kind of developed here. They went to India first to get more patients and data faster. And then they use that to validate, to sell to health systems here. So classic example of going back and forth between US and India. So uh, I see that that's gonna happen a lot too. And maybe it'll go the other way around, uh, India, US, back to India, so. Awesome. This has been a really engaging and good session. So thank you once again for making time and joining us, Sumit. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, and thanks for that. Yes, you're welcome. And uh, thanks for the invite and having me speak. It's pretty apparent that there are a lot of opportunities for the application of AI in the healthcare space. I hope you enjoyed this session. I certainly did. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube to keep getting content like that. You can also follow us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Our handle is the Zista Podcast. This is your host, Amit Ahuja, signing out. Till we meet again, we'd say, stay curious.